thank you for being here. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, I don't like preaching to nobody. You know, that's no fun. Uh, I, I, you, you got it. You want to deliver it. And you want people to receive it. And you guys make that happen. You are making my dream come true by being here and tuning in today as we study God's Word. Now, I'm going to share with you a little frustration I went through when I got saved. Because when I got saved... Uh, I, I came out of a very dark place. I came out of a very down, depressed place, a place of suicide. And, uh, and I saw the hand of God. So I, I knew God's reality. I knew his reality. He, he saved me. But my frustration was that as I began to go to church uh, and listen in a different way, I still could not get the word. I just couldn't get it. I heard it, I tried to do it, but it didn't work for me. Now, I know that didn't happen for any of you. You all have those halos from Dollar General, and you're okay. But for me, I, we didn't have a Dollar General. We had a family dollar, and I, theirs didn't work. That halo didn't work. For some reason, I just couldn't get it. And uh, so I became very frustrated for years. Uh, I say faithful because I thought, I mean, I knew that's what to do. God had saved my life. But I was frustrated because I could not see the reality of God's Word in everyday life. So I began to really press in and, and ask God to show me, to help me, uh, because all the, you know, I'm doing school, I'm doing church, I'm doing Sunday school, I'm doing even Bible college, but I wasn't getting it. And so I said, God, I need, a, I need you to open my eyes. There's scales on my eyes. There, there's something in my ears. There's something hindering me from understanding of this. And God gave me the revelation, and, uh, and I was so excited about it. For our men's advance, I built a contraption to try and explain it. Caleb, could you help me out here? Uh, Dr. Wing's wife, uh, Sister Isabel, was here in the first service, and she said, Pastor Ed was so impressed by this so many years ago, he came home talking about it, and, uh, and she said, and now here you are talking about it this morning. Thank you, son. son. And uh, she said... When are we going to ever get to see that thing? I said, well, it's kind of like one of those uh, Willy Wonka things or, or something. I don't know. I said, I don't, you know. Uh, she said, no, we want to see it. So uh, we dug it out during the sec between services. Townsend went and got it for me. And uh, so here's the revelation the Lord gave me. That when you are born again, you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. You are... Uh, all the old has passed away and all has become new. My frustration was the warts that I had, not warts, moles, I didn't have any warts, the moles that I had before I got saved, I had after I got saved. The aches that I had in my body before I got saved, I had after I got saved. Now I'm a new cre creation in Christ Jesus, all the old has passed away, all has become new. That, didn't, that wasn't a reality for me. Let's say this bottom jug is your body... This top jug is your spirit. We are made up of spirit, soul, and body. This gate valve here is your soul. So I was trying to see the reality of the manifest of this in my body, but I still had the bowls. I still had the aches in my body. I still, okay, and my soul is real. My mind, my will, my emotions, my memories, I, I still was dealing with depression. I'm born again. I've been delivered by the hand of God, but I'm still fighting a spirit of depression. And I did not know how to get victory over that. But the Bible says I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. So I kept thinking, maybe I'm not truly saved. Maybe I need to go back to the altar. Kind of like the revival I preached. There was one revival I preached, and it was supposed to be a, a week revival. And thank God, a revival really broke out. And it went for like six weeks. And uh, there was this one gentleman would come sit on the back row back here, and he would uh, come up at the end of every service and come to the altar. And I'd go pray with him, and he wanted to get saved. So I'd pray with him to get saved. The next, the day, night, next night he would come. The next night he would come to get saved. Every night he's getting saved. And so I talked to the pastor, and I said, this gentleman, you know, the, you know I pointed him out, and I said, he, he's, something's not clicking. He's trying to get saved every night. He said, oh, he's been coming to his church for years, and every altar service he comes up for salvation. And I said, well, he doesn't understand, you know, that, that you don't have to do that, you know. So I, I talked with the gentleman, and when I talked with the gentleman after the service, I just pulled him aside and said, can we go in a separate room and talk? And so he was telling me that he, he didn't feel saved because, and he had the same frustration I had. Because he's still dealing with things in his body, he's still dealing with things in his mind and his emotions that did not line up with God. 
and he's supposed to be a new creation in Christ Jesus. He keeps diving in, hoping he'll come up a new creation one day. And, uh, and, and thank God I got this revelation because when you get saved, this is your spirit. Your spirit that was under the Adamic, born under the Adamic curse, the Adamic nature was dead in Christ. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. So your, your spirit man was dead. If you died outside of Christ, you're going to hell. Not that God's sending you there, but hell is made for those who are outside of Christ. And Jesus came to open the way, become the way, the truth, and the life, so that everyone can come to the Father through him. So it's, uh, salvation is God's will that none should perish. is made available to everyone, but that doesn't mean it's automatic. Everyone who calls on the name of Jesus is saved. Hallelujah. If you believe in your heart, and confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord, the Bible says you're saved. But that new creation you become is it, and I would normally have this filled with water, but I wasn't sure it was leak-proof and didn't know if Brother Marty would appreciate me wetting the carpet up here, so I'm not trying it out. When you get saved, you got to join with me a little pretending here. This jug gets filled with the Spirit of God, the new spirit creation of who you are. You are <clears throat> everything that Christ provided through the atonement is yours in your spirit. <clears throat> everything is yours. Healing is yours. Deliverance is yours. Freedom is yours. Promotion is yours. Prosperity, God's way is yours. Anointing is yours. Glory of the Lord is yours. Everything is, say, this is full. But does it automatically flow in, uh, down to the body? No. Why? Because as I've got this big gate valve here, this gate valve is, is, is not in the right position. And because it's not in the right position, it is grieving, it is squelching, it is cutting off the flow of what the Spirit has provided for us so that if we died as a Christian, we're going to heaven because we're righteous, we're perfect in Christ, in Christ. That's why Paul talks about everything. It's in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. We're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We're the, you know, the Bible says prophetically, you're the head and the tail and above only and not b b beneath. Uh, why? Uh, the prophecy fulfilled is when you're in Christ. So all of that is in your spirit when you're saved. But now what we have to learn to do is how to open this valve, and normally water would start flowing, and if I turned it just a little on, it would trickle, but what we need to learn how to do is how to open this valve, which is our soulish realm, and get what's in our spirit through Christ flowing into our body. Does that make sense? So here's the focus of the message today is on this valve. This valve is our soulish realm. How do we get it, that valve open to let everything Christ has done, we didn't have to work for it, pay for it, Jesus did everything, but let it flow in and through to be manifest in our body. So we're talking about this message, how to get it from my head to my heart. How to get it from my head to my heart. All what I'm talking about today is learning how to open that valve and get it because this valve is controlled by your head and your heart. This valve here is controlled by your head and your heart. So if you're stuck in your head only, you're not going to see the valve uh, open. It has to go from the head to the heart because only faith can turn that valve. Only faith. Not, not parroting something, not pretending, not faking it till you can make it. And, and, and faith is the only thing that can open the valve and get it flowing. So let me... That's my setup of how to get it from my head to my heart, which means how do we open this valve. Now, John 8, 32, Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That word know is not an intellectual assent only. That word that God used by the Holy Spirit means that you know it to the place that you believe it, you experience it. Okay, so it's an experiential knowledge. If you will know the truth, if you will experience, if your faith will awaken uh, to the truth, then it will set you free. Hallelujah. You don't have to beg for it. You don't have to keep running to the altar for it. You don't have to give enough money for it. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to memorize enough scriptures for it. By knowing, by that knowing from head to heart, experiencing and believing, the freedom will come. So Jesus meant for divine truth in the head to waken divine passion 
in the heart. And that's when the valve moves. And Romans, that makes sense. When you understand it that way, Romans 10, 8, 9, and 10 makes perfect sense. Let's look at it and break it down together. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God is raising from the dead, you will be saved. Now, now you can underline in your mind that word saved comes from a word sozo, which means you're made whole, you're made complete. And it includes health, healing, finances, mental Uh, relationships, every aspect of your life, even eternity. So that doesn't mean just going to heaven. Thank God we are. But it means heaven coming to you on earth, flowing from the Spirit, Holy Spirit giving you and your spirit everything through the atonement, now flowing. But what do you have to do? You have to believe in your heart. Look what it says here. It says, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. This valve is in the wrong uh, position here. Nothing will flow from, through that gate valve. And get, to get that gate valve in the right position, in righteousness, in the right position, the heart has to believe. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's not just the head knowledge. We've got to get it from the head to the heart because with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. It opens up puts the valve in the right position, and with the mouth, then what you confess. Once this valve is open, now whatever you confess, what does he say? The confession is made unto salvation. So now when you confess your healing, and you confess your deliverance, and you confess your freedom, and you confess your peace, and you confess your joy, and you confess being used of God mightily to advance his kingdom, it's flowing. Because the power of the Spirit is flowing through the soul into the body because of a heart that puts you in right position, gets the valve opened up. Now, you're not just parroting words. You're speaking words from faith. Does that make sense? That's why it's such a heart issue. Jesus said in Mark 12 and 30, he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And uh, this is the first commandment. And the second is like this, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So we are to love with our heart, a heart that believes, a heart that trusts, a heart that is, a, faith is awakened in that heart. So in order for us to go from the head to the heart, we have to go to origin. Where does it begin? And it all begins here. We have to pay attention to the discipline that is needed for our, uh, of our minds. It starts with the mind. And we have to discipline it because it's so important what you think on. You've got to watch your thoughts. Look at that next sl- sl- slide there. It all begins here. You've got to watch your thoughts, okay? Because if you watch your thoughts, you, it's very important because they become uh, words, And your words, you've got to watch because they become actions. And then you've got to watch your actions because they become habits. And you've got to watch your habits because they become the character of who you are. And then you've got to watch your character because that determines your destiny. So if you want a destiny walking in the supernatural, miraculous provision and and demonstration of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you are truly the son or daughter of the Most High God advancing His kingdom, it all goes back to your thoughts. Because your thoughts turn into words, and your words turn into actions. Your actions turn into habits. Your habits turn into character, and your character sets forth your destiny. How many of you remember back in school? Maybe it happened with you, maybe not. I remember in the early 80s, this came, this big uh, promotion, you are what you eat. You are what you eat. It had signs everywhere. Uh, We were just looking at my yearbooks last night, and the kids were looking at and they were being nice about dad's pictures, most of them, and laughing at my friends because of the styles back then. But nonetheless, trends come and go. That's okay. But they came across a picture, I think it was Morgan, and said, what is this about the, the, the uh, canteen being shut down? And uh, because what's going on here? Well, it was this campaign. You are what you eat. So they started serving healthy stuff in the lunchroom. Okay, so everybody said, yuck, and went running to the canteen. So then the administration got together, and they locked the canteen. You're not buying soda, and you're not buying chips. You're going to eat this green stuff that's unidentifiable, okay, but you're going to eat this stuff because it's good for you. You are what you eat. 
And I remember, oh my goodness, the rumbling and the mumbling that went on on campus during that time. And, uh, and I grew up on a farm. I ate bugs and snails and whatever. We ate everything. It didn't matter to me. But I, I remember these, these kids that were picky eaters. They were just like, well, I'm going to have to start bringing my own lunch, you know. Uh, but as true as it is, you are what you eat, you are what you think. And let me tell you what, that affects you even more than what you eat. Are you critical of others? Do you mope around because you don't get enough praise from people and that you feel you deserve? How much time do you think on and speak about worrying on this or that? I mean, you're just worried about this. You're worried about that. It's easy to flip today through fake news, half news, true news, whatever it is. There's enough stuff going on to truly capture your mind and to get you thinking outside of the way God has created us to function supernaturally. And we wonder why we're so miserable and so powerless. How much daily time do you spend grumbling and complaining or feeling sorry for yourself? This is a test, but don't give me the answers, okay? This is between you and you and the Lord. Okay, I said you and you because there may be two of you there. <laughs> okay, how much time do you spend reliving the bad things people have said and people have done to you? How much time do you dwell on lustful and impure thoughts? These are questions that need to be answered do you ever review the reasons that you feel superior or more important than others or the opposite? Do you ever review the reasons why you feel less than and less important than others? You are what you think. Who you are right now, right now, is the sum total of where you're at in life has much to do with not what you want to be, what, not what you'd like to be, but you are the real you right now is a direct result of what you've been meditating on. So what I'm talking about today is not something we don't already do. We do meditate, but we're meditating in the wrong way. See, meditation is what closes what I call the 18-inch uh, gap. Some people say my gap from my head to my heart is 12 inches. Some people say my gap is uh, 14 inches. Listen to the sermon and stop trying to be so technical, okay? You know what I'm saying. Meditation is what closes the 18-inch gap between the head and the heart. If we're going to get this valve to open so that everything that Jesus has provided for you that is already yours in your spirit can begin to flow through your soul into your body, into your present tense, you please listen to me. We're going to learn how to get from the head to the heart. The thing that you meditate on today is building who you will be tomorrow and the tomorrow after that and the tomorrow after that and the tomorrow after that. Listen to what uh, Jesus says in Luke 6, 45. Jesus says, the good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. So if you've got goodness manifesting, it's coming out of what you stored in your heart. But look what he says. And the evil man, he brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So whatever you've been meditating on is where you've been taking these thoughts from your mind and depositing. What does he say? The good things that have been stored up or the bad things that have been stored up in the heart. What have you been storing up in your heart is going to determine when you speak what has power. The Bible says life and death is in the power of the tongue. So you can speak life if good is stored up in your heart. The power of God will give, give, give traction to when you speak life. If you've got bad stored up in your heart, you'll speak life and you won't see it. Nothing will happen. Just like a parroting word. So we've got to check out what is in our heart. It's a matter of the heart. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 7 and 20, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, from within, out of men's hearts, and he's talking about the bad here, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. Now, do you see the manifest of sexual immorality? When you see the manifest of adultery or a manifest of greed, that's not somebody just doing it. That's somebody who has been thinking on bad, which has been causing those thoughts to store bad in the heart. Now, from the heart, the Bible says these are happening. 
Well, the good news is just the opposite is true. When we meditate on the Word of God, the Word of God, we think on His Word, our mind is renewed and our heart is stored up good so that now when we speak life or speak blessing, the power of God is behind it to manifest. Hallelujah. So as Proverbs 27, 19 says, as water reflects a face, so a man's heart reflects the man. Your heart reflects and shows who you are. And then he said in Proverbs 4, 23, above all else, guard your heart. Guard your heart. You've got to go to your thinking because your thinking, what you meditate on, is what's depositing in your heart. So if you're going to guard your heart, you've got to go back and you truly got to discipline your thinking. So God has a plan to help us take his thoughts and make them our reality. When you see the thoughts of God in the Word of God, this isn't just a religious book. This isn't just something to say, wow, that sounds really good. It'd be neat if I could see some of that happen today. You can. You can see it all happen in and through your life. But you've got to, in order for you to take God's thoughts to become your reality, you've got to do it God's way. Okay. 1 Timothy 4 and 15, he tells us how. God has a plan that helps us to take his thoughts and make them our reality. How? Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. That you're going to succeed and it will be evident. It will be manifest. It's not something that's just in your spirit that you're thanking God for. It's not just something in your soulish realm. He says now the valve is going to be open. It's flowing into the natural realm, the body, and it will be evident to all if you will meditate on these things. So we thank God that you and I can align ourselves with God's Word and we can see the manifest of heaven on earth in and through our lives. Jesus said in John 6 and 63, He said, The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and life. So we have the life of God, the Spirit of God that come to us Come to us to flow in and manifest, and they come from the words of God. So the word of God, truly meditated upon, biblical meditation, brings it from the head to the heart, awakens our faith. So now when we speak it, that life and the spirit is manifest for everyone to see. Hallelujah. So meditation on God's word is the key. And I'm talking about biblical meditation. I'm not talking about secular meditation. I'm not talking about mindfulness. That the enemy is always copying. He's always copying anything that God does. He wants to copy it, but he perverts it. We're not going that route. We're going God's route. Biblical meditation primarily focuses on Scripture. It is focused on the Word of God. But it's not just pondering on the Word of God. It's not even just memorizing Scripture. It's so much more than that. Uh, that is one aspect, of it, but that is so much more than that. And I pray before I close this message, you'll have a better understanding of biblical meditation because it's one of godly, uh, God's exercises He gives us if we're ever going to practice dominion and glory in the natural realm. Hallelujah. He tells Joshua this as Joshua is now taking the lead. Moses has died. They're coming out of the wilderness, 40 years of wandering. Now they're going into the promised land. And in going into the promised land, he tells Joshua these words. This is God speaking to Joshua in Joshua 1 and 8. The, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. But, okay, the mouth, remember the mouth's important. But a mouth just speaking is just parroting words, has no power. So it's got to come from a heart that's believing. So look what he says. So depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate. How do you get it from your head to your heart? Meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do all according that it's written. For, when you, for then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. So you're going to see it come from your spirit, through your soul, and when you speak it, it will then give you good success. But you've got to meditate on the Word of God day and night. Now, he get, if you'll study this word in the Hebrew of meditate that he uses right here, it comes from the Hebrew word Haggah. And the Hebrew word haga means meditate here in Joshua. It has three layers of meaning. So I'm going to give you three levels of biblical meditation. And the first one is to imagine. That's the first level. To visualize God's word as you study it. So let's take an example. Okay. We've got, we've got healing. By his stripes we were healed. Right. We don't need Jesus going back to the whipping post to get us healed. Right. 
Amen? He hung on the cross to get the curse off us, to get the blessing on us. We don't need to re-crucify him. Everything he provided 2,000 years ago is ours. And when we receive Jesus Christ, all that he has is ours in our spirit. Our spirit is a new creation made perfect in Christ Jesus. Now we've got to learn how to get it from the spirit into the body through our soul. So in getting it through our soul to get this valve to open up, we've got to meditate on the word of God. So here we got saved. This was me years ago. This is filled. Just pretend it's filled with the favor, the blessings, the anointing, the healing of God. But I was still sick. I was very, very sick in my body. And I would say by his stripes I'm healed and nothing would happen. I, I, I would declare he sent his word and healed my diseases. I would declare the word of God. I shall live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. I was declaring the word of God. But it was just like it was just falling flat. Nothing was happening. That only happens to me. I know it never happened to any of you. But please hear my story and have a little compassion for me, okay? So here I was. Now, I knew God had provided for me through his son, Jesus Christ. So I began to, I got this revelation, so I began to imagine. I'm going to meditate on the word of God. That Jesus went to that whipping post for me. So I'm picturing that whipping post. I did research on it. I saw the cat of nine tails, these leather straps with rocks and glass and bone tied to it. That These Roman soldiers would rip and the flesh off of them, break their ribs. It would rip the muscle. It would tear open the skin. It was a cruel, brutal, many died at the lashing that took place there. And Jesus said, nobody takes my life, but I come and lay it down. So we know that nobody's drugged Jesus against his will. He did this, and I had to picture it for me. I knew it was for everybody else that would believe, but I knew I had to take care of me now. So I said, I began to imagine. And I said, and I began to see the blood splattering. And I began to see them, the, him naked and them humiliated and all that he went through so that I could be healed. He, by his stripes, prophet Isaiah said, by his stripes, uh, you are healed. So, so we're going to be healed by his stripes. Now he's there being beaten. I'm watching. I'm imagining it. I'm like, wow, Jesus, you, the pain. I can't imagine the pain that he went through. And, uh, and, and so I'm imagining that was for me. So now I'm getting a picture of it. So it's in my head. I've got all the facts. But now my emotions are getting involved because now I'm seeing that he did this for me. He did this for me. He doesn't want me. It's not God's will that I suffer with this uh, Ill illness that, I'm, that is debilitating. I couldn't live with it. I couldn't imagine living with it. And it was so painful. But I said, you know, you don't want me to live with it. You don't want me to come up with some doctrine that just puts up with this. You did this so I could be healed. So then I meditated upon it. Then I began, the next level is to mutter. Uh, the mutter means you speak it out loud to yourself. Uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I began to speak it out loud. I didn't just picture it and have my emotions involved. You know, I'm like, wait a minute. You, by your stripes, not only was I healed, that was prophetically. Peter says, after you did it, by his stripes you were healed. So it's a done deal. It's a done deal. So I began to declare, you sent your word. You healed me of my diseases. By your stripes, I was healed. My, the healing is mine. Healing is in the atonement. Healing, you've redeemed me. And I began to speak that to myself. Now, here's a little parenthesis I need to insert here when you start speaking to yourself. you got to learn to be honest. you got to learn to be truthful in all things. Because if you fudge and, and exaggerate with your mouth on other issues and you lie on other issues, your mind is smart enough to know if somebody else is a liar... And, you, and your mind says it, when they're telling you, you're always thinking, well, I wonder if this is the truth or is this half true? I really don't believe them. Why am I wasting my time even listening to them? Your mind does the same thing with you. You know what? You just fudged and told somebody, you know, you worked 14 hours this week when really you only worked eight. You didn't need to tell them. They don't even really care. But you just told them that. And your mind, you, what you say, I can't depend on. So when you get to this muttering where you're speaking the truth of God's word to yourself, your mind will start warfare. There will be a, not a demonic warfare. Now you're having an internal warfare. And, and you're arguing with yourself. I don't know if I can trust you. You lied about this. You lied about that. Maybe you're lying about this. And, and so now, so I just insert that for, for thought. You can repent and get all the lies under the blood and let's go forward telling the truth. But tell the truth in love. If some lady asks you, well, how do I look today? You know, you don't say, well, you look pretty rough. Look like you got beat up and thrown under, you know. Did you wear your clothes in the dryer when they were drying? You know, what's going on here? No, got to be truthful, but in love, in love. Okay, just change the subject. Okay, so, <laughs> but, so you mutter. So you imagine it, 
you imagine God, what he said, what is truth, what, and you got to imagine it for you. And you draw the picture of it, and then you begin to speak it. You begin to speak the word, whatever it is you're, you're believing God for, you begin to speak it. And then the third level of Haggai is to roar, to roar. That means you've got to shout God's word out loud. Why? Because you're going to face spiritual warfare. That now the internal fight is over. You now you speak in truth, but that but you go to open that. The devils of hell, every demon, every spirit of infirmity that's been enjoying trespassing in your body, every spirit of poverty that's been loving hanging out with you, every spirit of bondage and 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 and, and every kind of a indecency that has been hanging out with you. They don't want to go. They don't want to have to go look for another body. So spiritual warfare begins. So it takes it to the next level when you roar. When you roar is actually what the word means. Look at Isaiah 31 and 4. That same exact word, Haggah, is translated in the Old Testament in Isaiah 31 4 as a lion roars and a young lion over his prey when a multitude of shepherds is summoned against him. He will not be afraid. See, warfare is going to, something's going to come to try and take what you got, what you're believing. And you got to fight. So this is the fight. You got to roar. And now those shepherds are coming. They're not even afraid. He's not afraid. He's not disturbed by their noise. So the Lord of hosts will come down to fight for Mount Zion and for his heel. So here God gives us a picture of that word uh, meditate so that we can fight. That's, you know, you can roar during worship. When this song we were singing, he's given us all authority, amen, you could go, amen. We're not one of those amen churches. We're an amen church. You hear what I'm saying? Some people say, well, that's not trending today. I, I'm not into trending. I'm into getting heaven manifested on earth. I'm into seeing the power of God displayed and manifest in life. And you can't do it. If you want a denomination of, of silence, you know, and powerlessness, go right ahead. But here, we're going to see heaven invade the earth. We're going to see the word work, and we're going to do it God's way. I didn't come up with it. God did. So we're going to roar. You can roar through praise and worship. Hallelujah. When anything biblical is on the screen, you're singing out loud is a roar. You're shouting out loud is a roar. You're amen in the preacher when you come in agreement with the word of God. That's a roar. It stirs the demons that want to fight in the spirit realm. They're like, oh my goodness, I'm getting nervous. I don't know if I can hang out with this fellow anymore. The spirit infirmity is packing his bags and saying, man, I got to go look for another body to make sick because all this praising and all this shouting and all of this, man, it's scaring me off. There's warfare in that. How many times in the Old Testament did they surround a, a group of, of the enemy or come up to the enemy and they would send the praisers out front? They would, they would uh, who was it? Uh, Gideon was up there with just 300 men and they began to let out a praise. On the seventh day after the seventh time around the walls of Jericho, they let out a praise. And every one of those times, either walls came down or the enemy fell down. Hallelujah. And died or ran. We got to learn how to meditate. Praise God. Because the purpose of this kind of meditation is to drown out every thought in your consciousness, including thoughts that the enemy is trying to bring that causes the Word of God to fall none effect. You've got you to be bold. You've got you to go all out. Hallelujah. And some people may say, oh, my goodness, you've stepped over into that shouting stuff. You're crazy. You say, I'm crazy for Jesus, and I'm going to see heaven manifest. And whenever you want to get on board, I'll show you the way. Hallelujah. So here's the power of medita meditation. I know we're going a little long here, but this here is life-changing. This is life-changing. Okay, here's the power of meditation. Meditation drives the word into your heart. When you do these three levels of meditation, you, you imagine you, you mutter, you speak it to yourself, and then you begin to roar. What it's doing is it's taking it from your head and driving it into your heart. Hallelujah. So you remember in your head, you can still reason with God's word. In your head, you're still in that soulish realm where it's not secure. You've got to drive it into the heart because remember, out of the heart, out of the storage of the heart is where we see the manifest of either good or bad. Okay. Secondly, meditation gives you rhema. Now, rhema is God's relevant message to you. Okay. That's so important that it gives you rhema. Why? What I'm holding in my hand, this Bible, is the Logos. This is the established, created, unending, it is irrelevant. I mean, it is uh, without error. It's inerrant. 
It is the word of God. God breathed. This is the logos, the established word. Now, you've got to take from the logos and receive a rhema, which means this is God's word for the world, but now this is what he's saying to me. That's why this meditation is like go to the whipping post, and you're, this is for me. Not being selfish, but you've got to get a rhema in order for your faith to be awakened. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So you've got to awaken faith, and faith is in the heart. So you've got to meditate. You've got to imagine. You've got to mutter. You've got to roar. And it will drive the word into your heart, and then you will get that rhema. That this healing is yours. By his stripes, you, you, I was healed. I was healed. This is mine. Hallelujah. So very important. And then the third, another powerful result of meditation is that it helps you appropriate the word with all of its promises and power. So what happens now is you start reading the word of God and whatever you see a promise of God, wherever you see a covenant, uh, 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 all the details of the covenant, you're like, that's mine. That's mine. Because you've been meditating. Now it's not just for the church or it's just for these people back then. No, that's for me. Right there, that's for me. I claim this. Underline it. You write it down. And so now you're appropriating the Word of God with all of its promises and all of its power. So that has to take place through the transformation that only God can do when we meditate. That's why Romans 12 and 2 uh, says it this way. Do not be conformed to this world. That word conformed means pressed. Do not be pressed into the mold of this world. This world exerts pressure. Anybody ever felt it? Anybody feeling it now? It's trying to press you into its mold. The Bible said do not allow that. But the only way that can't happen, you know, everybody gets sick, everybody's broke, everybody's busted, everybody's disgusted, everybody's in fear, everybody's what? For that not to happen, you've got to be transformed. And that word transform come, is the word in the Greek, metamorphosis. That's where we got, why we got that picture up there, the caterpillar going to the butterfly, through that process of metamorphosis, transformation. So you go from crawling on your belly to flying in the freedom of God, transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind, and when you look at renewing of the mind, it's not just learning facts, it's the mind and the heart combined to where it brings forth the demonstration of the new truth. So now you can prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That destiny that God has for you to be the head, and the, t uh, the head, not the tail, and above only, not beneath. Blessed coming in, blessed going, all that, that, that he has for you. Now you begin to prove that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Hallelujah. It's gone from the spirit through the soul, opened up, and now it's flowing into your life to that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So as you practice meditating consistently on God's Word, you, be, you find you begin to think like God because your mind is being renewed with how He thinks. You're beginning to talk like God. Isn't that cool? You begin to act like God. His character superimposes. You're transformed. You're metamorph There's a metamorphosis. And you begin to walk like God. And what did he say? Everywhere the soles of your feet shall tread, there is established my kingdom. So you're ushering in the kingdom of God in and through your footsteps. And everywhere your hand shall be placed, he said, the blessing shall be established. Hallelujah. And that's not just for preachers. That's for everybody. Isn't that great? It's for all of us. Praise God. So your whole life becomes a reflection of the word. Praise God. So at this point, God arises in you and his enemies scatter. That's what I want to see. Every one of us go and begin to meditate God's way on the word of God in such a way we, we, we begin to imagine, we begin to mutter, we begin to roar, and this thing gets from our head to our heart. We now believe now when we say what God says, now our heart through faith says it with words that bring forth authority that every uh, dark force has to flee and is freed up for the manifest of heaven on earth. Hallelujah. He says in Psalm 68, he said, God, let God arise and his enemies will scatter I want that for every one of you and when this happens it's impossible for any sickness to remain in your body it's got to go 
It's, it's impossible for any bondage to remain in your life. It has to be broken. I'm telling you, every promise he has, meditate on it and see it manifest in your life. Hallelujah. That's why he says, and I'm wrapping things up here, Proverbs 4 and 20. He said, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them where? In the midst of your heart. Why? For they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. I've got a word of hope for people today. That whatever it is in your life, in your body, in your relationship, in, in whatever your career that is not lined up with the Word of God, you can take the Word of God and change what is out of alignment. You can take the Word of God, and if I'm telling you, if you've got a relationship where there's things that's been cut off and the blessing of God is not flowing, you can take the Word of God and the promise of God that it too shall become one, and that God's blessing is on your house, and God's blessing is on the marriage, and you represent the church and the bride of Christ, and everything that you represent. You can now begin to meditate upon that. And you can not only meditate upon it by imagery, but now you move to where you begin to speak the Word of God. You find every scripture you can. You speak it through a, a truth-telling tongue to yourself and let faith begin to rise because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And all of a sudden, it awakens faith in your heart. So now you begin to do what? Roar! You begin to say, I take my marriage back. I take my home back. I take my health back. And what happens? The valve opens and every Everything from heaven that is flowing through the Spirit is now flowing into your marriage, flowing into your health, flowing into your finances, flowing into every area of your life. You've got to take authority over your own destiny. And you've got to say it comes by the Word. i got to get the Word in my mind. i got to meditate to get it in my heart. And once I believe and faith is awakened, i got to speak it with authority and the Word will work. I guarantee you every every time hallelujah hallelujah so my prayer for you is what happened in Ephesus when Paul went there in Acts 19 and 20 he began to preach the word and the word grew mightily and prevailed the word the power to prevail was already in the word but it began to grow. Their faith began to grow. They began to meditate. They began to hear the word. They began to say the word. They began to roar the word. And they awakened faith in their heart. And then the word prevailed. I want the word to prevail in your home. I want the word to prevail over your body. I want the word to prevail over your finances. I want the word to prevail over your children. Don't just let your children go. Don't you just say, well, they got their own path. You have authority. You're a parent. You are the guardian that God used to raise them. You take that authority. And say, wait a minute. This may be two, three generations down, but I still, I'm in the line. I'm in the family tree. I'm in the guardianship line. I'm going to use my authority. And where it talks about whole households being saved. You take those words. You imagine what Jesus did to get the whole household. Don't let, don't let the cousin, even the cousin that acts like a knucklehead, don't even let them go to hell. No, no, no. Use your authority. And you, you know what? You'll find they'll start coming to the Lord. And they, you know, they're like, I don't know why. I really don't know why I just felt led. <laughs> the power of God went out there and compelled them, began to compel them and bring them in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we must see the Word of God increase and prevail in your life. Remember what he told Joshua. Do not let this Word depart. Don't let it depart from your mouth. Meditate on it. Meditate on it. And he tells us in Philippians 4 and 8, Finally, my brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble or honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy. This translation says think, but it really is meditate. Meditate on these things. The power of meditation, biblical meditation, takes it from the head to the heart, awakens faith, with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. The valve is turned into the right position from the heart that believes. We've got the head knowledge. How do we get it to our heart? How do we awaken it? 
biblical meditation. I pray that you will make this a part of your life from this day forward, and you will see the glory of God begin to bring forth fruition in you through your life. Hallelujah. Would you stand? Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word, practical instruction that brings about a powerful, a powerful result in our lives. As we align ourselves with your creative order, biblical meditation, your creative order. It's not something we came up with. It's not something the world did that we're copying. This is what you teach us in your word. The world may copy it in an impure form, but that doesn't disqualify it. No more than someone claiming the rainbow for something that doesn't align up with your teaching of your word does not discredit the symbol you gave us in covenant that you would never destroy this earth again in flood. So, Lord God, we take biblical meditation to heart. And I pray, God, each and every one of us would choose this day, this is how I'm going to begin to live in going forward in a supernatural way. If you're here today or you're tuning in and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your, your, your jug up here, this top jug is filled with death. It's filled with, with a destiny to hell. That's not God's plan for you. He wants it to be filled, born again, new creation. He wants everything that Jesus provided in and through his atonement given to you, but you can't receive it until you receive Jesus Christ. So if you're here today or you're tuning in and you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, surrendering your life to him, in this closing prayer, please do that now. Your eternity depends on it. The Bible says everyone who calls on the name of Jesus shall be saved. The Bible says that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord from a heart that believes that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It is God's will that none should perish, but that everyone would come to salvation. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we might be saved than the name of Jesus. Would you call on him right now? Jesus, Jesus, Son of the living God, Come into my heart. I want to surrender my life to you. I want to begin this journey of living as a son or a daughter of yours. Father God, I thank you for making the way through your son, Jesus. There is no other way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to you, Father, except through him. So I come to Jesus, your son, my Savior. Jesus, come into my heart. I give you my life. I want to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And if you prayed that prayer, you need to let us know. We've got some material that can help you get your first steps going and get you tied in and get you uh, going secure in such a way that the enemy's not going to come and take you back, okay? So let us know whether you uh, uh, email us or whether you message us on our website or Facebook or you hear it, go by the Welcome Center and just say, I gave my heart to Jesus and I want to give my information so I can get on my next step, okay? We just want to say, God bless you. May God go with you. May God protect you and may the spirit of the lord manifest mightily in and through your lives this week we love you guys may god bless each and every one of you amen